All right, so we are here with members of the uh, vehicle team. Uh, I want to say, I, at the start, start of the show, I made it very clear that marketing did not make any of those videos. Developers made any of those videos. I can't help but notice uh, that Polaris took out that Idris really quick. Are, are you start trying to start about 50 different arguments on Reddit? Oh, yeah. We, we love for the uh, arguments. Love them. Polaris for life. <laughs> After Idris. Ben, would you like to go on record? Uh, oh, all ships are equally as brilliant as each other. <laughs> Until they get what's coming to them. And Ellen, would you like to revise your answer? F the address. <laughs> I didn't want to make this video. A lot of times people tend to uh, take note not too kindly to the messenger. But this is me setting expectations for a very expensive ship so you have all the facts before you consider the ship. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Thank Tim and some subscribers. Okay, so let's get into it. The Polaris. The Polaris has a unique situation going on thanks to Citizen Con having a demonstration showing it knocking out an Idris in a single volley. Yes, yes, if you've seen me on the many discords, if you've seen me pinging devs, if you've seen me posting on Spectrum about this, this is what I'm going on about. And for those who don't know what's going on, at CitizenCon, there was a white box demonstration showing a half-finished Polaris firing off a single volley of four size 10 torpedoes and insta-popping an Idris. Now... I want to set some expectations because I don't want people thinking, oh, I can just buy a Polaris and knock out every single ship in the game, one hit wonder, and just wander away happily. No, absolutely not. But does that mean the Polaris is a bad ship? No, not at all. In fact, I own, I own a full disclosure. I own a Polaris and an Idris for very, very good reasons. And it's because of the expectations we have of these ships. Do we have them right now? Can I unequivocally say that I can fly in and do this or that or not? No. But based on everything we know, based on devs' accounts of what's going on and what the ideas behind a PDS system is and other defensive measures are and the uh, damage uh, potential of these torpedoes versus damaging them before they actually hit their target. I want to dig a little bit into that little nuance uh, that needs to be known. The Idris is often the, the bellwether, the testing bed, the uh, thing that everybody looks at and watches. And uh, when the Kraken was introduced, uh, the Kraken was shown blowing up an Idris in a picture. And then quickly after, people realized that this isn't really the Kraken's role. The Kraken would be releasing a, an entire flight of ships. And yes, it does have that single larger turret, but it's not really designed to be a ship of the line going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Idris's and uh, other fleet ships and such. And then quickly after that, they released the Ares, which also had pictures of... Um, taking down an Idris and even an image, a video of a single Ares going in for like a looking like a bombing run from a side profile and just firing off a couple shots and the Idris exploding. And yes, of course, that's a demonstration. And now the latest one, the uh, at, at Citizen Con this year, we had a Polaris firing off a single volley. And even though the Idris was, was, was fighting back and firing turrets and such randomly, it seemed like uh, it had no contest against, these four, against this volley of torpedoes and simply exploded into a million pieces. Okay, so uh, we're going to skip by a little bit of the history now that I've covered it with the Ares and the Kraken, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I want to dig into, by the way, uh, I will have a video at the end here about the Kraken's real role and its uh, real world counterpart, by the way, uh, some interesting side notes. But um, back to this, I want to dig into this Polaris Idris rivalry that is being ginned up to, in my belief, in my belief, I have no proof of this, but my belief it's to sell Krat, it's to sell Polaris's. Plain and simple, it's the latest thing. So we've seen it in the past to sell Krakens, we've seen it in the past to sell Ares. 
series, Ions and Infernos. And now we're seeing it to sell Polaris. And yes, should you buy a Polaris? We're going to go into that a little bit later. But the point is that there is very, very good reasons to purchase a Polaris. As I said earlier, I have a Polaris and I have an Idris uh, for different reasons to support my org operations and friends of my org. Uh, so uh, why is it being done? The Polaris is a major focus point of development coming up into 2024. It is the first of a generation of backlogged RSI ships that are going to be sold and they need this thing when it hits flyable to be flying off the shelves. And they see this test at IAE, a not combat uh, um, large event that sells all sorts of ships, including combat ships, but not just combat ships, as like a bellwether. And I strongly suspect they will continue these sales into ILW, which is Invicus Launch Week of 2024, you know, in just a few months. So why are they doing it? To sell Polaris's. Why is CIG being tight-lipped about this? That is an interesting side topic. Uh, I asked a few different developers at different times. I'm not going to single any one of them out. Uh, but I have asked a few developers publicly. I'm not trying to like play any, oh, I, I have special connections or something, and I'm not trying to burn anybody. Uh, I have a few different contacts at CIG that I keep in touch with uh, for different reasons. And... They are, this is not some, uh, for the record, I am not a leak person. I am not into that stuff. And also, uh, I, I am not interested in making one dev uh, feel hot around the collar or something because they were able to tell me something. So I have purposely, purposely only asked in public um, about, about this topic and nobody will answer me. And one of the reasons is because some developers contend, well, it's a different team. It's a different, it's a different part of CIG that covered that. It's a different whole de de developer, um, part of the development. And I believe some of that is due to the fact that we have a ton of new teams descending upon our blessed PU uh, from Squadron. So suddenly there's a whole bunch of additional teams across the world that are suddenly putting a bunch of, uh, in lockstep, putting stuff from Squadron and porting it over to the PU, as much content as possible. And part of that processing kind of, uh, in my opinion, uh, seems to have caused a, 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 while it's a fire hose of new content, and I'm really enjoying it on the PTU, build after build, uh, especially leading up to IAE this year, and I hopefully after IAE we see another resurgence of that, there is a little less who exactly is handling what. You see, before this, PU was like handled by a few dozen people. And so it was very easy to like locate specific people. They answer the question and that's it. I think that this problem is going to get worse over time. Yes, uh, before in the comments, people write, but there are certain pillars, there are certain people. Yes, there's certain key players. And even some of those key players uh, cannot answer <laughs> Um, it seems, uh, who exactly would be the correct person to ask about this developing feature of the PDS plus existing ships that are in the pipeline. And then also we're dealing with the idea of ship balancing ships that don't even exist yet. So there's some people that can't answer it yet. There's some people that can't answer it currently. And there's some people who still can't answer it either way. <laughs> so uh, we're dealing with metaphysical situation here that CIG has created by creating this demonstration of two ships that are not in the game fully yet. Even though the Idris is in the NPC's hands, that's not the same as a balanced for players ship. Uh, <laughs> we have created this, this weird situation of like a no man's land until a few months from now when we start seeing PDSs, hopefully in the next few months, uh, we see them starting to be implemented. So if we can't have any specific developer answer why uh, if this is a realistic demonstration or not, or if this is, is this is ex positive expectations for Polaris, how do I think, how, how do I know, or how do I, am I so convinced that it will not be something very simple that Polaris can simply ride by the countryside and blow anything up in space? There's a couple different reasons. 
One, that's unbalanced. Two, they will need to factor in point defense systems. So I've gotten nine minutes into this video and I'm finally bringing up PDSs. So I'm going to put a chapter in for this. <laughs> but anyway, uh, point defense systems, plain and simple, are, sh are, 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 are weapon systems that are designed to counter torpedoes and incoming missiles. So they are automated, they instantly snap to it, and they fire upon them and put DPS on target to knock out those incoming things. They have a finite amount of ammunition or they have, if they're laser-based or energy-based in general, you have a situation where they only do so much damage. So PDSs have a unique role where they are balanced in the sense of their short range. They may have limited ammunition, depending on what type of, uh, of PDS we're talking about, if there's different types in and, and the final iterations. And then also they tend to be able to only prioritize certain targets. In the past, we've seen Poe's talking about they may be able to shoot at fighters, et cetera, et cetera, but you'd have to be stupidly close for this to, uh, to, to matter. So for, to go back to those Ares and such, they have size seven weapon systems. And when they're not, <laughs> for balancing reasons, making them inaccurate at range, uh, they should be able to fire at, at reasonable ranges, most likely outside of PDS's ranges, unless the capital ship physically flies at them, which would be weird and probably a bad idea. So PDSs are not really meant to be an offensive weapon system unless you're physically at like ramming ranges uh, of an enemy fleet and out of desperation you're getting close I guess and trying to use the PDSs and other unique uh, techniques uh, to uh, get some stuff done. But in general, PDSs are more of a defensive measure, especially for a maneuvering capital ship to buy itself time to take a volley off the field uh, of a specific incoming missile or torpedo system, and it gets to a point of a question of size 10 torpedoes. The larger the torpedo is, the larger its health pool will be. Now, it will also possibly move slower, and in the demonstration we saw in CitizenCon, these torpedoes were moving pretty, pretty quick. Um, and that brings up a whole other topic of, once again, balance and what can be done and what can't be. But they're not exactly, they're not like a hypersonic weapon system. They are moving target, and if they are destroyed or incapacitated or jammed in, in, in any which way, and by the way, the bigger they are, the harder they are to jam. But if they are, um, that's effectively DPS off the field. Now, we look at a ship of the line, such as an Idris or a, especially a Javelin. Uh, these ships have, yes, they may have missiles. And in the case of the Javelin, even bigger torpedoes, by the way, size 12s, um, that will blow up, <laughs> that will um, can open or a Polaris if it hits it. Um, but their main weapon systems are not those things. Their main weapon systems are what's called STS, ship-to-ship -ship, uh, weapon systems. And in the case of the Idris, it has a size 10 spinal weapon. So we we're talking about a beam laser, if we're talking about the Idris K kit, or which is an Idris P Ken mount, by the way, the Idris P comes with the mount. That's literally what a K kit is. It's just a pile of parts for there. And more on that in a minute about PDSs. And then the Idris M, which any Idris P can be upgraded in the game to for a significant amount of cost per the devs, um, has additional armor and it also has a ability to mount a rail gun because it has an additional power plant to run that said rail gun, a size 10 rail gun. And the rail gun has an incredible amount of damage potential. In the case of the Javelin, it has two massive ship to ship turrets. Turrets. They are not spinal. Well, they are spinal mounted turrets, but they can spin slowly slew to targets and hit them. So you have this situation of these ships that can do an incredible amount of damage that does not care about PDSs. You cannot just PDS a shot from one of these large weapon systems. And these, these capital class weapons are designed to destroy other capital class ships. The Polaris is a lightly armored capital ship designed to run and gun. It's designed to patrol. It is not designed to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against another capital ship. So the Polaris has a unique issue if it was to employ its weapon systems against these large ships that it's, that's designed to take down. Oh, you see, here's, here's the fun part. I just said a Polaris is designed to take down large capital ships. 
But I just spent all this time talking about the Polaris as if it can't take them down. That's because it's not meant to work alone. If it was to fight other large ships, capital class ships, specifically capitals, it needs something else there. You see, capital class fights, we don't know how many exactly we'll be able to fit on the same instance. However, what we do know is that multiple of these ships will be able to be in the same grid, at least based on the numbers of players that are intended to be in a server and how big and big it's going to grow. So there will be support fleets. CIG and all their cinematics shows whole little groups of ships. For Squadron, it's massive. There's multiple javelins on the field, Idrises, everything you can imagine. And also a whole bunch of other support ships, such as hammerheads and other fun things. Designed to screen and knock out things like torpedoes. That's specifically their role, is to fight off fighters and torpedoes. So, if you have an actual fleet fight, where there's a whole group of capitals versus a whole group of capitals, even if let's keep it simple, let's just say six on each side, Regardless of what kind are on the field, you're going to have the situation where every single one of these ships is rocking PDSs, it's using screening techniques, it's trying to put ships in front of the main capital ships that are the most costly to replace and the most important you can't lose, that are commanding the fleet, that are running uh, fighter operations and flying in and out with, with carriers type operations. Um, they're going to be sitting towards the back trying to snipe from there. Then you have your screening vessels with hammerheads and such that are sitting in the middle. And then you have your fighters, your bombers, etc. that are constantly running across the middle trying to hit a different, different areas, handling flanking maneuvers, etc. But the ultimate true flanker is the Polaris. Once this battle is joined, within minutes, the PDSs will start burning through, preoccupied with all the fighting going on, all the missiles and torpedoes flying across the grid, they may even run out of ammunition between between roles that crew, most likely NPC crew, reloading all this equipment, or um, the automated services that are reloading these, whatever it ends up being, uh, will have to handle. Or if it's energy-based weapons, there's only so much they can do before they overheat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Between those situations, you will have the ability to bring Polaris's in at unique angles behind the enemy's fleet and attempt to come in and bounce off of a moon and then come back and quantum into the fight from different directions. And if there is no quantum entanglement nets or something like that that are snaring everybody in, you would have this situation where they can come in, sit back at a range, fire off a volley or two, and then continue on and already be calculated in their quantum to zip out of the flight. And then come back in at a different angle. And if the battle starts going your way, and one or two of the enemy capital ships run off the field, now the Polaris is really shine. Once those ships start running off the field wounded and damaged and barely able to even move, and they're already, they're already running away, the Polaris is tracking them down, utilizing different scouts to find their targets, getting in there, um, holding these, uh, these quantum entanglements down, holding them down, and then swinging in with the Polarises, and then ripping them apart to shreds. And a single Polaris or two Polaris would be an amazing hunter-killer pack to take down these ships. They take down these wounded capital ships that already have exhausted a lot of their capabilities, and now it's their time to shine. The Polaris is not a <laughs> a one a one person uh, one one ship uh, killing machine. It is a it is a wolf, and it can act in a pack of wolves or by itself as a lone wolf. And I gotta say that that's its true power when it's pvp based on all we know now now this could change 50 more times but just understand what you're buying and that's my point is that it and and granted this video may be too long uh for some people but you're spending serious cash or you're ccuing and limiting your options severely if you pick up this ship uh, so if you ccu to a polaris the problem you're going to face is that you are now sitting at the 750 USD price point. There is very little above that point that you can choose from. You have effectively limited yourself out of exploration ships. You have effectively limited yourself out of most even combat ships and um, most industrials that are significant in size because we still haven't seen them grow very much. 
you know, there's a lot of capital class vessels that, that are in, in quasi caps, a whole slew of quasi caps that you have effectively limited yourself out of by picking up this ship. Just remember that you are locking yourself in. Yes. Is it a wonderful ship? Of course. I have one. I straight up told you that. And I, I think it will have its value. Why do I have one? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, it's the best capital we're going to have. Um, for those who knew me uh, and have seen my videos uh, in the past with an 890 jump running around, they'll know that I've used the crew level of the 890 jump as a wonderful capital trainer. And this may sound crazy, but you have a bunch of crew quarters, you have a hangar, you have a CIC style little uh, bridge area that's a battle bridge inside of there. You have regen medical and you have a <laughs> you have a garage that can fit large vehicle. So you have this immense amount of space. You can have people practice the unique traits of a larger ship and uh, trying to fly a capital class vessel. And it and it enjoyed the uh, the nice large shields. There's nothing quite like uh, those shields and and all that capability all packed into one ship. It is very hard to take down an 890 jump, even though it can't do too much without a bunch of crew. And you start feeling the uh, limitations of those turrets, except for the front one. So, it brings up this interesting uh, topic. If we are talking about putting an actual ship in the game, that's a true capital military vessel. I'm all for it. And uh, the one limitation I am concerned about is how do we balance this damn thing? And even though I have one and I love an I win button, I don't want to see these things romping across the countryside, destroying everything in sight. Well, there is an answer. Ships as small as the Phoenix and all the way up through capital class have something called a PDS, a point defense system we talked about earlier. Now, there may be different sizes of PDSs. There may be different quantities of PDSs. In fact, the Idris K kit covers that. Uh, so they include four PDSs inside the Idris K kit. The idea is that it makes it more combat oriented of the Idris. So on the demonstration that was covered at CitizenCon, where a Polaris one volleyed in Idris, it is entirely possible that it was an Idris P that does not have any PDSs at this time. That we that we know of and that may change because even the liberator comes with a pair of pdss that's right i said two pdss there's one on top that everybody knows about so when you look at the front of the ship to your left is a man turret to the right is a pds and there's another one at the bottom towards the back and if you look on the hollow viewer when the turrets are working you will see that pds now even the liberator has a pair of pdss in John Crew's own words, he said that the, they added the PDSs to the Liberator so it wouldn't get, just get knocked out. And I'm paraphrasing his words. But the point is that it has some potential energy. I think they took a look at the Liberator. They realized how many people could possibly be on this ship at any given time. And they realized that a tally could sucker punch and knock, at the very least, disable this thing and harass this thing uh, very, very easily. Even if it had a pair of uh, super super hornets on its decks you know it doesn't matter because the tally can come in and just really wallop it and then run away so that's not acceptable the pdss expand the fight they make it take longer to destroy the vessel or even do significant damage to the vessel so for example even on the liberator using that simple example of just a pair of pdss in in a liber in a in a tally situation, firing off its size nines, not size tens, but size nines, it, it should be able to at least take out some of those torpedoes coming in. Then it's spamming its its flares and chaff, and you know, its noise and everything else, what, it, what you want to call it in, in, in game terms, and then it whatever hits hits, and then the pair of super hornets try to eviscerate the tally. So it, it, then the tally is forced to wait to reload while the PDSs are still rocking, and of course the man turret and the pair of super hornets. And don't forget, if one of those torps does hit, the Liberator can still spin to win and put its and puts its side that does not have damage to it armor facing the tally. So these ships can move in 3D just like their attackers. 
Uh, I think people forget that, especially ships that are designed to carry huge torpedoes tend to uh, have less ability to maneuver and keep their axis up, especially when they're getting hammered by a pair of super hornets in this theoretical example. So it brings up like an interesting topic of where exactly do PDSs stop and start on their power? Well, they're not overpowered for starters. Eventually they will run out of ammunition or they will overheat or they can be tricked. Somebody could be peppering smaller missiles at the PDSs and hopefully CIG will allow us to uh, set this thing to set PDSs to target torpedo, uh, to prioritize torpedoes. But is that a viable topic, ter ter a viable situation? Possibly. After all, if you time it well enough and you have one target firing missiles and then bam, 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 and then, okay, fire a torp now while the PDS is overheated from the missiles, it would not technically be, it would technically be timing it to prioritize its targets. Another topic is with PDSs, just how many will be on the ships? Well, we have two for the Liberator and we have four in the Idris K kit. So that gives us some hint of what it is. However, the Idris K kit is pretty long in the tooth, whereas the Liberator is newer. The Liberator is not supposed to be a combat vessel. It's supposed to be a ferry. It's supposed to be a ferry that's not even doing combat logistics technically, even though we'll all, let's not kid ourselves, we'll all be using it for that. Um, so for those who don't know, combat logistics is when you're close to the fight, if not in the fight, desperately dropping in resources to keep the fight going and then getting the heck out of Dodge. Usually combat logistics are not ships of the line. They tend to be ships that are uh, in and out of a fight area or close to a fight area. And the the common use case for a liberator during combat logistics would be trying to save an outpost, so landing nearby, trying to sneak it in with escorts, landing, dropping, getting the heck out, or attacking an outpost, landing multiple liberators uh, slightly outside of enemy's range or with E-War and other types of, 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 of coverage, and then getting out of there and then going back to res resupply with more equipment to bring in to continue the second wave push. And combat logistics usually works hand in hand with the main combat fleet. So communicating that information and as the, if the fight's going well and all the ballistas are getting knocked out and all the turrets are being knocked out, literally landing just outside of the outpost and deploying, etc., would not be unheard of. Ships have significant amount of shields and even armor even on ships that don't aren't necessarily have a high reputation for high armor. Uh, plain and simple compared to land vehicles. Land vehicles, land that we know of, land structures, aside from invulnerable ones when you're in the safest areas, uh, will, at least as of now, tend to be geared towards balanced around ground combat. So ships that are significant in size can suddenly swoop in and get out of there and soak up some damage while they're doing this, this type of work. Although we'll see, once again, we have to test all this. Um, and there is one ship that breaks the bank on combat logistics. You have the Idris. The Idris series of ships has a large ramp at the rear door of the ship. And it creates an interesting perspective uh, for combat logistics work that I think a lot of people are severely underestimating. Being able to plop down a ship with capital shields, capital armor, and rocking four or more PDSs that are shooting down any torpedoes and missiles incoming. And then also, don't forget all of its manned turrets and remote turrets, etc. And its automated missile pads and everything else. Uh, this thing's going to be a monster. Being able to just drop literally next to the enemy plopped out its ramp, but completely ignoring incoming damage, unless there's such a thing as a capital class anti-ship turret or something on the ground. In which case, the A2s will bomb that out of existence pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, CIG, if you ever bother to listen to this, um, you're going to need to balance that. Because <laughs> that's the first thing we're all going to do, is prioritize any anti-capital uh, technology on the ground. And it will be vicious the amount of damage that it will need to soak. Um, maybe it needs to sit underground and vulnerable. And then you, when you open the doors, it becomes vulnerable or something. I don't know. But if you don't balance it, we'll show you what we can do to it. <laughs> and then uh, the capital ships will descend on that target location. 
and they will drop entire armies of vehicles onto that location. And there's nothing it can do against it. You can pack dozens of ballista around that thing, and it won't do anything to an Idris. And back to topic, the Polaris. Uh, the Polaris, the Polaris, the Polaris. The Polaris does it in a in a 1v1 situation is a terrible choice unless the ship is wounded or something like that when you were talking about it against a combat capital. But when we're talking about wounded ships, when we're talking about other targets that are quasi-capitals, it will be a monster. It will be a, 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 a sheer danger. And I think a lot of times when you see a Polaris during your scans, you will take heed and you will wonder what it's up to and be tracking it carefully and who owns that thing. Get, let's get eyes on it. And if it is a pirate ship, it will be prioritized and hunted because that thing, especially if it's nice and healthy, is extremely dangerous. Um, another thought I had about the Polaris in general, now that we're, let's just switch gears a little bit because this video is getting long, is the use in PVE content which I think it will truly shine at. In general, what we know of the Vanduul is that they have pretty heavy hitter ships that tend to be pretty large in size and scale, uh, but they tend to have very primitive technologies on board. So the Vanduul, for example, their fighters like to ram enemy ships. They're, they like to overwhelm enemy ships with incredible amounts of firepower based on what we've seen, and like if you take a look at the, the Driller, for example. Yes, it is dated, but once we, I'm sure we'll see it in the Squadron and we'll get proper information on it. Uh, but for now, what we know about the Driller and some other mid-tier Vanduul ships is they're just extraordinarily stupidly large and they have a ton of torpedoes and such. And the Polaris is probably the closest thing we have to meeting firepower of firepower. Being able to just chuck volleys and volleys and volleys of size 10s is really going to be useful against uh, Van Duel and, uh, you know, in pitchfork style battles, being able to take them down. And I think that once again, we go back to the concept in PvP of let the battle be joined, bait in the fight against the Van Duel, and then in come one, two, or dare I say it, even three Polarises from a unique angle and just pound them out of existence. And remember, we're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with PVE content here. Unless there's physically CIG uh, FCing, uh, fleet commanding, the Vanduul fleet, they're going to be, uh, well, they're NPCs. There's only so much they're going to be able to do to counter unique roles. Having a ship that has extremely dynamic profile and high speed for a capital ship and being able to come in at unique angles and take it down with these unique uh, play styles is going to extremely throw a wrench in the works of what any NPC AI is going to expect. Once again, this could all be thrown out the window if CIG actually has a single person FCing these constantly. And whenever these incursions happen, there's an, as in game events, suddenly, um, uh, they can just swipe and move and whatever and move their screening vessels, but they will have to react and it will take moments. They can't just teleport the defenses into position. We may have to get closer than we expect. We may need to go into unique, uh, risky situations for those poor Polarises, but boy, can they do some damage and we'll get them in there. So how I feel about the Polaris, know what you're buying know what its limitations are you i wish i would have had a very straight shot polaris discussion here but because they had the demonstration at citizen con that is unrealistic and because cig refuses to say what the limitations on that demonstration are so far um i posted since last wednesday on on spectrum and uh, across multiple discords asking questions to devs in public um, and I haven't gotten an answer. I have to, have to, have to have this discussion. I had to have this sit down about what it is against the Idris and how it's not the new Idris and how we've had in the past multiple new Idrises, how Krakens have taken down the Idris, how Ares series have taken down the Idris. There's probably one I even forgot showing pictures of it, destroying an Idris. The Idris just seems to be the punching bag for everything. 
and it doesn't deserve that. But that doesn't mean the Polaris is a bad ship. It doesn't mean I'm against the Polaris. Once again, I own both the Polaris and the Idris. And I have to say that these ships have a place. The Polaris has a place. Know its place, know its strengths, know its weaknesses. No, even with the area it has on board in the Polaris for your ground vehicles, is it ideal for combat logistics? No, it has light armor. It doesn't have anywhere near the capacities of defense of an Idris. But will it be great in the short term? And will it be great just delivering to outpost equipment and other things? Yeah, of course. Of course. Does it have a wonderful little hangar on board? Yeah, absolutely. And I think people will gladly show you how it will max out on hangers. I'm not even, I didn't even bother covering that in this video because we, that's just a planning assumption. What we are focused on though is the limitations and what we know about those size 10 torps because they will change things. As a reminder, size 9 to 10 is going to drastically change the advantage of damage potential it has. So don't just assume it's like, oh, it's like a tally with just a bunch more torps that can reload. No. It's going to be bigger, better, nastier, and costlier to run. Um, not just literally reloading the cost of the torps, but also costing a significant amount of fuel, significant amount of maintenance cost. When those modules that are some of them are capital components finally go, they're going to have to be replaced. And um, another thing to remember is that as we see more and more of these capital ships come online, they will need significant locations to repair them. They will need dry dock style and largest stations in existence to uh, replace their modules. So you may relent on this and we may be able to do maintenance on the spot, like as long as you keep up with the maintenance type of thing, the components never truly expire, but we'll have to see all that. Right now, you have to remember the limitations. And the first true combat capital will be in existence. And that's an exciting uh, watershed moment. I hope Polaris uh, comes out soon. I wish you luck in your decision if you're considering one. And I stand by what I said. Be very careful, especially if you're in the CCU game, because if you go up to a Polaris, it will lock you out of a lot of options. So with all that out of the way, let's talk about the Polaris itself as a purchasable item or a CCU. At that price point, you have 750 you have very, very, very little that is above it. You have the Pioneer sitting at 850 nowadays, the value. Yes, as of this year, the Pioneer is at 850. You have the 890 Jump at 950. And then, of course, you start going above the 1K price point. At the 750 price point, you have the A2 Herc. And I have to say that out of that whole little area, the Polaris is an excellent, excellent, excellent option. Additionally, you have the Hull E sitting at 750, but that's limited. So, what do we have to think about with the Polaris? We have a lot of unknowns. Once again, because we don't know the relationship between those size 10 twerps and PDSs, and because we don't know exactly how many of these size 10s will be required to do the job, we can't say exactly how efficient this ship will be at damaging quasi-cap and capital class vessels, which are what it's designed to hunt. Additionally, because of its light armor and because of its nature of trying to be a run and gun, lightweight capital, we have to bear in mind that it will take more damage than usual during fights. Where So it will require more maintenance costs, technically, I guess you could call if you want to call repair costs, maintenance costs. And it will also factor in that you do, while that is nice to have a hangar, you have to factor in that you'll have to cycle through ships. And what I mean by that is... If you have a whole flight of fighters covering you and scouts and such, you will need to like land at a midpoint and have them each take turns landing at the hangar to be rearmed, resupplied, refueled, etc. So in general, you will have, say, systems the size of Pyro, which are five, four to five times the size of Stanton, depending on if you count the edge of the planets, etc. Um, and let's say you cross all of Pyro. And before you go into Stanton, you want everybody fully loaded up. You will literally have people halfway through through Pyro. Uh, you'll be stopping off and having all the fighters landing one by one or two by two if it's small enough onto that hangar pad, landing, fully closing it up and stuff, I'm guessing, and then giving it hangar services and then opening it back up. Now, if CIG makes it easier you may be able to just leave the hangar pad open and exposed and one by one they can just land, barely tap in, 
few seconds go by and it automatically does it. If it's not automated, you will need to have a player or at least an NPC standing there handling the refueling. This may take longer than you expect, but it can do it. Where other ships have more than one pad at any given time, that's like an official pad that actually can handle refueling, rearming, repairing. Uh, so bear that in mind, but it can do it. And that's pretty damn cool. And uh, I would say that that itself adds a tremendous amount of value to this ship. The Liberator does not even have pads that are designed to accommodate, repair, rearm, refuel. They said, oh, well, you can hand redo it. And you do have the storage right there on the lower lower deck to move, you know, prop missiles and other things and fuel. You can hand fuel and such. But it's not the same as having an actual serviceable pad. The Polaris will be, if the release schedule holds up and there's no surprises, it will be the first ship that has a full-size pad where you can land a fighter, of a, uh, not just a snub, and be able to do all those services with it. And the ship, once again, does not just have torpedoes. It has multiple turrets. It has missiles on board. Uh, it has a unique um, armament system where you could, in theory, have a group of fighters traveling around with you and those turrets hammering on stuff and those missiles hammering on stuff and not use the size 10s or use the size 10 to finish off something or soften it up. And not, you're not going to waste a significant amount of size 10 torps on a target. So I, I think its value is also there too. And I'm going to state the obvious. For piracy, it will be a wonderful uh, home ship to run everything out of. Uh, if you have one group of pirates that has this and one group of pirates that has a cat, uh, there is no contest. This thing's going to rip apart the cat. Uh, so I, 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 I strongly um, suggest uh, the only limitation and unknown that we have is the maintenance cost and repair cost of such a large vessel. And the fuel cost will be high. We just know that off the bat based on other ships that we have. Uh, this ship operating in Atmo is probably a bad idea as much as possible. You want to stay in space. You want to keep your you want to keep drifting and uh, keep your fuel cost at a minimum. You want to move this ship around as little as possible, ideally. Um, and you just target the target, basically. And uh, that's where it is. Now, for PvE content, if you can find large enough PvE content, which the devs have continuously said they're trying to balance ship, they want to have content that is big enough for these type of things and i would say especially at least in the short term in-game events that would be wonderful for this ship uh i i i, I can't i can't say good enough things about it i think the polaris is gonna be a wonderful for that and for organizations that are willing to finance this ship once again going back to what devs have said over the years over and over um even the ship itself might not be cost effective but it's what it brings to the table for the organization, escorting Hull Ds in the future and Hull C uh, convoys now. Um, the Polaris will certainly shine very well. Uh, so it being able to bring a deterrence factor to, to the fight uh, will be very good. I think also it'll be sitting in this happy situation of there isn't a lot of things designed to take this thing down early on other than another Polaris, um, at least in the short term. And that brings me back to short term one more time about the value of this thing is highly dependent on how PDSs behave. I do not believe they will release the Polaris into the wild without PDSs active. I just don't see it. I also think that there's a high chance that th this thing will hit about the same time as the Liberator. The Liberator has been a ship that they've been quietly working on. They said they need it for Pyro to be the ferry to Pyro for small organizations and to really build up Pyro into like this area that smaller ships can get around through using that ship. I see this as kind of the counterpoint to the Liberator. Like I told you earlier, the Liberator has two PDSs on board and a manned turret. And, of course, a complement of fighters that will all be hammering on torpedoes desperately that are firing. But eventually it will go down to this thing. If it can't get off, it can't run off grid. So it's more of a question of, can the complement of ships on board the Liberator uh, pop the uh, mantis that is that is stopping it from running away before the Polaris can uh, can ha can destroy it or disable it. <laughs> um, so uh, in this theoretical scenario, so I I, I think that um, this ship is highly depending on PDSs and what their value is, especially for PVP content. And the Polaris in its current value is excellent. 
but that could change if the PDSs are too over or, or, or too powerful. Um, if this thing needs to throw millions and millions of UEC of Torps out the door in order to take down a single Liberator, um, it better be worth it. <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to take a lot of damage in the process too. The very least, its escorts are. So the Polaris is a valuable ship no matter what. I see it as a wonderful org trainer, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot like it's the new 890 in the future. Um, know, know its price point, know its risks, know its value. And finally, uh, just remember to talk about these type of ships with your org mates, your friends that you find yourself flying with constantly. And what you may find out is that you're all planning to get Polaris's. It's much more valuable for having one person with a hauler, one person with a crucible, maybe one or two Polarises, if we're talking about the specific ship, if you're all gung-ho about it, and then a whole bunch of escort ships for all these things. Not everybody needs a cap ship. And not if you are if you are dead set, like I want one to be the crown jewel of my fleet, that's great. Go for it. I'm, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but try to talk to your friends and maybe encourage each other of like, hey... If you're not super excited about this specific ship, have you thought about this one, this one, this one, or this one? Because we have other, you know, uh, roles and responsibilities that we need done, and you can still enjoy having the um, the crown of a cap ship, but we need this, this, and this. <laughs> so bear that in the back of your mind. Um, the last thing you want is a situation where you're all rocking po Polaris's and you have nothing to escort, nothing to nothing to uh, to act as uh, as your as your as your screening vessels and such and uh plain and simple uh, plain and nothing whatsoever uh to to need to convoy around to with those polarises uh so that's just some thoughts in the back of my mind i'm uh, sorry for how long-winded this video was but i i really felt that it, it only way to be fair is to make this kind of a long format and a uh, good discussion and once again if you're making a decision this large you should spend some time talking with your friends and org mates. If, if you don't want to listen to me, listen to them. Uh, talk with each other. See what works for you. Because I, I obviously everybody's situation is different. And I welcome discussion down in the comments. I welcome discussion on Discord if you want to talk in private. I also welcome discussion on Reddit. I, I, always. So all these different methods to contact me um, if you want to talk about your specific scenario. I gladly will. This still shocks people to this day. <laughs> I respond to every single thing and at the uh, that I possibly can when, when it makes sense to. And, uh, of course, I read every single comment in all these different places. <laughs> so, all right. Have a wonderful rest of your IEE. Have a great weekend. And, yeah, fly safe.